We're getting up close with wildlife in this next session. Watching animals in the wild is one of the most memorable experiences that one person can have. When done responsibly, wildlife travel can benefit local habitats, endangered species, nearby communities, and travelers. We're going to learn how to encounter wildlife in the most responsible way with Janine Duffy from Echidna Walkabout Tours. Janine Duffy is one of Australia's best wildlife guides. She's a world award-winning tour operator, koala researcher, and educator. She started the nonprofit Koala Clancy Foundation in 2015 with a mission to inspire travelers and local communities to help ensure a future for wild koalas. She advises on wild koala tree planting and research projects. Janine, it is so wonderful to have you here. Um, and Echidna Walkabout Tours and Koala Clancy Foundation, we're going to be learning all about this uh, today and also learning about wildlife travel and how to do that. Um, the best way possible, and so I'm just so excited to have you here. Oh, thank you so much, Claire, for inviting me. It's great. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, uh, well, let's let's jump right in. Um, I am curious, uh, when it comes to um, wildlife tours, uh, you know, interacting with the wildlife, um, what are some ways that we can have the most positive impact on these places that we travel to? Well, I think firstly, you know, go to somewhere where the animals are wild. Um, if you travel to a place where animals are living in the wild, you're supporting the communities that have protected their wildlife in the wild. So they get, they get benefit from that and it makes them more inclined to protect their forests and their waterways and their, and their ecosystems. So, so, I mean, I'm not saying don't go to any captive experiences, but if you can make the majority of your travel to animals that are living in the wild um, and, you know, do that responsibly, that makes an enormous difference to the animals just in that single step. Wonderful. Thank you. That's, that's a great start. And it makes me think of um, on Thursday, uh, earlier today, we played um, a new documentary called uh, The 2.5% The Osa Peninsula. And uh, so they, they're kind of talking about locals over there and how they're starting to get into sustainable travel and they're starting to do these wonderful tours um, through, through wild areas. And uh, uh, what was really cool is that you have a lot of locals who see this wildlife every day, and it's nothing new to them. You know, they see it all the time. And, uh, and so when they're, you know, leading a traveler through there, and the traveler's like, oh, oh, my goodness, look at that over there, and that is so cool, and what kind of flower is this? And um, it makes it so much more special for the guide, you know, because they, they can see oh. it from a whole new perspective. And, oh, yeah. And, and when people are starting to get jobs from doing that, um, they then learn more. They, they then, you know, pass on that benefit to their own families and their friends. And we're seeing it happen in our local community around Little River in the Yuyangs, just west of Melbourne. Yeah, people are talking about wildlife. They're talking about tourism. They're talking about, you know, opportunities to to have good jobs and protect their wildlife, which is what they fundamentally want to do. But up until, you know, this point, they just haven't seen any connection between jobs and wildlife. And so as soon as you create that connection, um, you've got a wonderful grassroots movement that you've created. Oh, so exciting. <laughs> so yeah. exciting. Wonderful. Um, and so, yeah, nature tours are really growing in popularity. I mean, everywhere we've seen, uh, you know, people wanting to see nature in its wild habitats. And um, so what are some elements to look for in a tour to, to know that they are doing it responsibly, um, that animals are, are being supported and, and that, uh, you know, conservation is happening? This is a really hard one. Um, I just, Claire, did a, a desktop survey because we're working on a conservation project Australia-wide uh, amongst tour operators at the moment. And what I found is that um, there was no single common factor between all of these really good conservation-minded travel operators, um, except they were all locally owned. Oh. 
Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Wow. So I, I I went through their websites and checked, you know, what what is you know publicly available about every single one of these companies, and many of them had a conservation page uh, or a sustainability kind of page on their website. Some of them didn't. And yet I know that they have a really deep and profound conservation ethic, but it's maybe just not the way they handle their own website. Okay. Some of them had uh, memberships to organisations that you immediately think of, you know, like the International Ecotourism Society and things like that. Some of them don't. Uh, it doesn't, I think every company approaches things differently and has a different uh, method of getting you know, to the place they're going. Um, but there's no single factor except that they are all locally owned. And I think that there's something to draw from this, is that if you're supporting a locally owned business, no matter what they do, their money is staying local. They have a more profound, I think, reason for doing the right thing by their local environment, by their local community. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, they have more investment. Um, exactly. <laughs> it doesn't guarantee... Well like, huh. Yeah, it, it doesn't guarantee that they're doing things the way you want, but that's when... Maybe that's a starting point. And then maybe you look at their website. Maybe you look at the photos of how they interact with wildlife and you think, yeah, this looks like the sort of thing I want to do, or no, you know, I don't like the look of that. Um, maybe you look at their TripAdvisor reviews, all of those sort of things, and see what people say. But it's it's a really it's a really tough one. There's no single answer. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, well, it's, yeah. That's, that is very interesting, and uh, um, it I mean it goes to show that if you if you want. Um, a really meaningful experience, if you want a good experience, you do have to do some research. <laughs> you do have to, to yeah. go in and you can always email them or reach out to them and ask questions. Um, I yes. mean, I, I've always found that sometimes it's hard at first to, to get out of that bubble sometimes and ask questions, but um, they're always usually happy to answer. <laughs> oh, and look, if they're not, go somewhere else, yeah. I would think. <laughs> that, yeah. yeah, that may be a good uh, red flag warning. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, so, I guess, tell us more about your tour company, uh, Kid and Walkabout Tours. We're a social enterprise. Um, so, so, for those who don't know what that means, in Australia it means uh, a business that has a mission and that uh, invests more than 50% of its profits into that mission. So, you can be a for-profit business, which we are, um, or you can be a not-for-profit, it doesn't matter um, either way, but you, you're doing it for a purpose rather than for um, making money for the shareholders, you know. Okay. So our mission is to, it's a big one, um, is to ensure the free living future of Australian wildlife mm -hmm. and to use tourism as a way of, uh, of creating economic value for wildlife. And, and so, you know, we, we've kept it nice and broad because we deal with lots of different types of wildlife. Uh, we're particularly known for koalas. Uh, we do some koala research. We've been doing that for 19 years now. Uh, but we also work with eastern grey kangaroos, with wombats, with wallabies. Um, it's, you know, we see, oh, amazing amazing wildlife all over Australia. Oh, wonderful. Oh, man, I can't wait to get out there. <laughs> oh, it's, look, it, it's, it blows our mind. I mean, we're sort of, um, it's a small industry in Australia, wildlife tourism, but it's, oh, it's so exciting. You know, when you're at the sort of pointy end of something, um, you're breaking new ground kind of thing. It, it's, it's really, really fun. You can almost try anything that your your heart uh, desires and see whether it works. Yeah. It's great fun. Ooh, very exciting. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'd like to talk to the, the idea of all your tours have what's called conservation actions. 
Um, could you uh, explain a little bit more about what that is and, and what it means for, for travelers? Yeah, um, I think when we first started wanting to do something active with our clients uh, for the environment, we had this idea that volunteerism was something that you had to be knee deep in mud, it, you know, it had to be dirty, it had to be painful, it had to be three weeks long, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and that doesn't work for the majority of tourists right. who are who are coming to a place to enjoy it. It does work for some, but not the majority. And we could see that there was some benefit in doing a program like that, you know, maybe once or twice a year. But then again, if we could combine a small conservation action into every single one of our tours, we would have 8,000 people a year doing this conservation action. And potentially that's better than one week of, you know, of long-term serious hard work. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little, a little bit of it, uh, progress every day is, is better than one chunk every, every couple months or however, <laughs> or, uh, however often right. you could get that special volunteer. <laughs> that's exactly right. So, so we had a project in mind um, that that we thought might suit. And there's a, a weed, an invasive plant growing in the Yuyangs, which we had realised was very bad for the koalas. Um, basically, when the weed completely surrounds the koala's tree, the koala uh, stops using that tree. Uh, we don't know why, uh, but we think it's a physical barrier for them. They don't feel comfortable, you know, walking through it. Um, so we thought, yeah, um, and, and by the way, parks, uh, the National Park Service prefer that you remove it by hand uh, because there is uh, an endangered orchid that lives in the same areas and machine removal can damage the orchid's uh, environment. So, so we, we decided that we'd incorporate uh, removing one weed per person into every single one of our tours that visited the Yu Yang, so 8,000 people a year. Yeah. Um, we made it optional. We ran a six month trial mm -hmm. just because we weren't sure if it would work. And Claire, within one week, we did not need to run a trial mm -hmm. because everyone loved it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was. Oh my gosh, it was completely life-changing oh, to watch people uh, embrace this idea. Oh. <laughs> so, so we get, we get, at that stage, most of our travellers didn't even know they were going to be doing this because it was such a new concept. Uh, they'd booked with a travel agent, say, in the United States and um, probably six months before, so there was no time to let them know. <laughs> Uh, and they were going out there wearing their nice clothes and amongst all the other wonderful things they were doing, they were being asked to pull out a weed and some of them did not want to stop. Oh. <laughs> we, we had families who were determined to clear the entire yu yangs of the weed in one day, which is not possible. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So there you go. Never. There you go. <laughs> but what we found, and we've been doing it now for five years. Uh, what we found is that it switches on um, elements of people's brain, I think. Um, some people learn through doing things. Um, some people learn through seeing. Some people learn through hearing. And by giving everyone an action that was different, um, a lot of people who maybe, you know, hadn't connected at that point suddenly went, oh, yes, this is me, that they found that there was a place in the tour that they could fit, you know. There was something they could be proud of that they did. Uh, and it's changed our whole attitude to what we do. And, and, oh, Claire, I could go on and on and on to some of the theories that we've come up with as to why this works. But um, I think a small action that is uh, slightly difficult, uh, 
it's not it doesn't work as well i don't think if it's if it's too easy or if it's too much fun um it needs to feel like you're sacrificing a little bit of your time for the the good of x so in our case for the good of the koala wow <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I can understand that, uh, you know, where you sacrifice a little bit of your time, some sweat, some energy, um, but that feels good. It does always feel good to do something like that for, for another being, you know, or, um, you know, plant life even, to, to see something beautiful grow. Um, that's, that's so satisfying. <laughs> oh, it, look, it is. Uh, immediately when we started this, our customer satisfaction levels went up. Um, they were already high, um, but they went up through the roof. Um, and we've hardly ever had a single person refuse to do it. Now, it's optional. We don't force anyone to do it. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, we deal with a lot of people. Yeah, wow. And <laughs> to have that kind of broad uh, appeal it just makes me think there's potential in the tourism industry that's not being tapped yet. Every company should be doing something like this, even even if they only do it for the promotional, you know, benefits out of it. It's uh, even if they only do it to feel inspired by humanity again. You know, yes. uh, it's <laughs> it, it's a wonderful thing. It yes, changed yes. my view yes. of of our travellers entirely. Wow, that, that is very inspiring. That is very inspiring. Yeah, and we won a big international award for it too, the Responsible Travel uh, Award, the Best for Wildlife Conservation. Congratulations. So, so uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the Koala Clancy Foundation. Um, you, you mentioned you've worked with, uh, you know, many different animal species and, and, con and conserving and um, you know, helping endangered species, uh, but Koala Clancy seems to be um, maybe maybe one of the larger foundations that you work with. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit more <laughs> um, about how Koala Clancy came to become a foundation and um, uh, just kind of the history behind it? Okay, yeah, Koala Clancy is a real koala. He lives out there in the Yu Yangs in the wild. And he started um, being active on Facebook um, in 2014. <laughs> and he's got a, a lot of friends. <laughs> so he's great. He's, he's really quick typing because he's got two thumbs on each hand. So yeah, you should see him go. <laughs> but we started the Koala Clancy Foundation in late 2015 um, because we could see as a result of this weeding program that we started on our tours, we could see that there was so much more potential for this. Um, and we wanted to reach out to the local people uh, living around the area where Koala Clancy lives and we, we wanted them to feel really invested with what was happening with the koalas there in the Yu Yangs. Um, because we really do firmly believe that no one individual can save a species or, or even a, a local area. Um, that working as a team, and we're a big team, we're, we're 20 people here at the Kidman Walkabout. Um, some of our best ideas come from team members, you know, when we're sitting talking about things. So if we expand that team to include the whole local community, uh, we could really get some amazing things done. So Koala Clancy Foundation is, uh, is fully supported by a Kidna Walkabout. We do get other donations for Koala Clancy Foundation, but at the moment, the, the major donor is the tour company. Um, and we plant trees in June to August, and we've started already this year because we had such excellent rain. And our hope is to fill the river valleys with the native trees again 
um, because out on the western plains of Melbourne, uh, a lot of the original koala habitat was in river valleys and uh, and there was grassland um, outside of the river area. So so the best koala habitat was, was alongside the rivers. And a lot of those trees have been lost um, just due to, you know, old farming practices um, and, um, and, and change of conditions and things like that over the years. So many of the farmers and landowners are really keen to have the native trees planted uh, in their stream sites. And it's not hard to get trees. There's plenty of government programs that offer trees, but the, the single thing lacking was the, the hands, the people to do this. And so... We take out volunteers, mostly from the city, mostly from Melbourne, urban people. We take them out on Sundays and get them to plant trees. They love it because a lot of city people need connection with nature now. Uh, we need families whose kids have never seen a kangaroo in the wild. In Australia. What? It's un Australian. <laughs> yeah. I know that was possible. And, I know, and and so so for twenty dollars, uh, which which doesn't really even cover the cost of running this, but it's a way of you know getting them to contribute a little bit. Um, we can take out anyone of any demographic um, in um, anywhere around Melbourne or Geelong or the, the local urban centres, and we can get them doing something good for wildlife. And it's been so inspiring, Claire. Oh, it's we've made friends out of it. We've got regulars who come every second week. Um, it's just, oh, it, it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. And so one day when I'm gone, there'll be people looking after those koalas out there. I hope. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that, is, that is so inspiring. I, I love hearing oh. that. <laughs> Wow. Um, and so, uh, kind of talking about koalas, and uh, I mean, there's there's been some question from uh, viewers and, and from some other people that you know koalas are really cute. We want to keep them around, um, but some people are asking what role do they play in keeping the ecosystem uh, healthy and thriving. I was wondering if you could help us answer that. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Uh, I see koalas as being like the canary in the mine. Mm. So ko koalas need a very healthy natural environment to live. Mm. And the sort of things that can cause koalas to decline are very minor changes in the management uh, of the forest. Okay. So koalas are an indicator species, I believe. Mm. If, if your forest is not in good condition, you'll find the koalas are declining. And if they did nothing else, koalas would be very useful for that. So we walk out into the Yu Yangs forest um, after researching there for nearly 20 years and we can see really noticeable changes in the health of the forest. Okay. It's, it's, not, you know, it's not doing very well. Climate change is affecting uh, the gum tree woodlands of Australia very, very seriously. But because trees are long-lived uh, and have very, very deep roots, in the case of you know our big eucalypts, they're slow to show the impact of things like climate change. Uh, and only forest experts or people who've been travelling in that area and noticing it for a long time, they're the only ones who see it. Everyone else who comes into the forest thinks, oh, it's beautiful, you know. Right. There's leaves, right. there's, there's trees, there's all the things you could want. And so, and so I see koalas as, as being the ones that tell us when the forest is in trouble. And unfortunately, koalas are telling us that almost everywhere. We need to act. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Mm. Mm. There's a few species that rely on koalas. There's a, a very cute little thing that we've noticed. Um, there's two bird species that use koala fur to line their nests. Oh, and 
you can imagine how warm and, and snuggly and beautiful a little nest would be if it's lined with lovely thick koala fur. Oh, those are lucky chicks. <laughs> I know, I know. So one of them's called a black chinned honey eater and it's a very beautiful little bird, uh, black, white and green, uh, but they're in decline. And I wonder if that's related to the koalas being in decline. Oh, maybe. Uh, and the other one is the brown-headed honey eater, and he's a very vocal, very active little fella. Um, they, oh, they're so funny. They're tiny. They're smaller than a koala's hand. Oh, wow. And they'll perch on a koala's back and pluck fur like crazy. And sometimes the koala hates it, and sometimes they quite like it. <laughs> like a good back scratch, maybe. Exactly. It's a little massage. <laughs> huh. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, hopefully hopefully, the more that people can get involved and help protect the forests and, and take care of them in, in the ways that, like you said, you know, pulling, pulling weeds, planting trees, um, hopefully reducing environmental impact in other ways, um, maybe, that maybe there is a way to kind of turn the tide and, and keep these koalas and their other, you know, wildlife friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, from from declining. Mm-hmm. Uh, so apart from conservation actions, um, what are some other ways that uh, travelers can help save koalas and preserve you know natural habitats, um, either while they're traveling or maybe even when they get back home? What are some ideas? Oh, when they get back home, that's a good idea too. Um, I would say the best thing people can do. Um, for animals in Australia, for wildlife in Australia, is to is to come over and stay in one place for longer. Um, I think there's there's a tendency with Australia for people to think of it as a once in a lifetime journey. Uh, it's a destination that you can go to once. You can tick off the highlights. You know, Sydney, Melbourne, rock, reef kind of thing. Um, And then you go home and you've done it. And nearly everyone who I meet who's doing that says, "Uh, I wish I'd stayed longer. Uh, I wish I'd done fewer things and stayed longer and enjoyed them more. And I will come back. And so I think take the pressure off yourself. Don't do you know, four destinations in 12 days. It, it's not good for the planet to do that. Uh, it, it, it takes a lot of infrastructure. It takes a lot of, you know, carbon emissions for you to move around an enormous continent yeah. uh, in that short of time. Yeah. It's, it's hard. And it also means what you tend to do is the big popular stuff, uh, the stuff that you've heard of, Um, the stuff that has, you know, the enormous multinational company running it, um, which has enormous marketing dollars. It's not always the best stuff. It's, I would say it's usually not the best stuff. Yeah. Really? I I feel like sometimes when um, you do those things, like you you get to put yourself in, in the postcard that you've always seen, but then you don't have a new story to tell when you go home. Um, you know, and sometimes it is good to, to see those, those bigger things and there's ways to see them that um, are less impactful. Uh, but at the same time, you know, why, yeah, exactly, why not stay longer and have an experience that no one else, you know, in, in your circle of friends can probably tell. <laughs> you know, you go home and you tell these amazing stories and, and that's what it's really all about is coming home and, uh, and you know, sharing that experience. Yes, exactly. Um, have something to share, you know. Um, I, I think probably this works for most destinations around the world. Wouldn't you agree? I, yes, I would agree. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of slow travel. <clears throat> I know some people don't always have, you know, a full week even. You know, they have a few days and, and they just want to be able to spend those days, um, you know, tra- seeing one place and, uh, you know, and that's fine. Um, but I've always been a fan of, you know, if you, if you only have one day to spend, then walk, you know, start early in the morning and don't take that bus tour, just walk everywhere and, uh, you know, go down some of the side streets and stay off that, that main beaten track because you're going to find some things that are special 
and uh, and you're gonna you know see some real culture and uh, you're gonna see some real wildlife. And uh, I just I, I feel like no matter where you are, slowing down gives you that that special experience that that people don't normally have. It does, it does. And it doesn't matter how long you've got to spend. If you've got seven days, you know, stay in one place um, rather than doing two. Um, anything, I think, that, that leads you to do something in one day, just do it in two instead. I, I think everything you do, just add on a couple of days to every single thing you do. It's very rare that you get to a place that you think, oh, gosh, this is boring. I have to leave as soon as possible. Yeah, you, uh, very rare yeah, that that happens. Exactly. I've never been in a place where I ran out of things to do. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, neither me. I mean, if, if you run out of things to do, you might not be looking hard enough. Yeah, right. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so, that's, that's great advice. So, And the benefit you're doing in doing that is quite enormous. Um, I really believe one of the best things tour operators can do is offer two-day tours where everyone else offers a one-day tour to the same thing because the minute you stay overnight in a place you are just about quadrupling the benefit to the local community of doing that. Now, you're staying in a local place that's often locally owned. Um, you, you're buying food from the local environment, um, from the local community. And so, and so one day tours are, are really tough on the environment, I think. Uh, try and do two and three days. You'll get to know your guide better. Um, oh, you, you'll see so much more. You know, we do, we do a three day Great Ocean Road tour mm -hmm. where a lot of companies do a one day tour of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we almost always see echidnas on that oh, trip. Cool. <laughs> no matter what time of year. Because you've got three days to do it in, you might not see them on the first day. Right. Well, and that, but you will see cool. them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that yeah. is really rare. That, I mean, because I, I really haven't talked to many people who have been to Australia and been on these tours and, and they haven't seen it, uh, an echidna or, you know, some of those animals that, you know, we hear so much about and they didn't get to see it. And that's probably why they didn't uh, really spend enough time in that area. Yeah, that's right, that's right, because if you're doing half-day or one-day tours, you're out at the wrong time of day anyway. You, you don't have the chance to do the morning and the evening. Right. So, so stay... Yeah. <laughs> mm. wow. oh, middle of the day is hard for wildlife wherever you go. Yeah. So, right. so one-day tours are, are tough for wildlife. Um, stay longer. It'll be worth it. <laughs> exactly. I always felt noon was time for a good lunch and, and a nap <laughs> instead yeah. of out trying to find wildlife because that's what they're doing. You know, they're sleeping and <laughs> enjoying probably that exactly. warmth. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Lovely. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing um, about Echidna Walkabout Tours and about Koala Clancy Foundation. Um, do you have anything else that you would like to share with viewers before, uh, before we move on? <laughs> So if there's one thing I would suggest for tour operators out there, people in the tourism industry already, if you want to implement a conservation program, an action um, in your tours, keep it simple. I think a lot of us make the mistake of overreaching and trying to do too much. If you start with something small, something practical, something that you can manage, you're more inclined to follow it through. And then... As you see it working, you can add to it later. So that's my biggest advice. I think that was the thing that made the key to our success with this action. Wonderful. Very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you again. This was, this was wonderful.